Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Smiling faces everywhere. I like it. Uh, I guess the groundhog says it's an early spring like it hasn't been already, so that's good, right? Uh, and I think there's some sort of game tonight. I don't know. I heard something about it. So we got any Niner fans out there? I know there's one for sure. And Jeff's a Chiefs fan. What's the, what's the odds that a man's team does not make the Super Bowl for 50 years and he's in Thailand? <laughs> I mean... You know what? That's, that is a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So uh, I know he's over there uh, making a difference for the kingdom. And that's what it's all about. It's about God. It's about God. It's a beautiful life, and there's lots of things that get our attention. But if God's not first, then everything is for naught. So um, welcome. My name's Mark Pritchard. I'm the associate pastor. We are going to worship God today. We're going to lift up the name of Jesus. We're going to just engage the Holy Spirit. So um, who's excited about that? Huh? All right. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus. Okay, so we're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to get into the word. Keep the Thailand team in your prayers if you would. So let's pray. Father, you are awesome. We love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you made us alive with him. Father, I lift up the team in Thailand. They are already bearing fruit, and I know more is to come. I pray for energy for them. I pray that doors are open, that they step into them boldly. And um, just thank you. We just thank you. We praise you. Bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's get up and worship God because he has done good things for us. He is king. He's our savior. Let's praise him today.
mighty God would lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. He's done such good for th things for us. Even when everything else falls apart, his love never fails us. We praise him for that today. Even if we make our bed in hell, he's still there with us, waiting to pull us out.
make all things work together for my good. Father, we know that you make all things work together for our good. You used our very sins to work out good in writing your love story of redemption and healing in us. But even when we were still sinners, you died for us. Lord, we love you. Because you've done such good things for us. The psalmist writes that so many times you pulled us out of miry clay, out of the realm of the dead, out of our sorrows, and you bring us into your life. Let's sing about that. There I was, empty handed, crying out from the pit of my despair. And there you were, in the shadows, holding out your hand, you met me there. And now where would I be without you? Where would I be, Jesus? You were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night. Out of my battles for me, you were my rescue story. You lifted me up from the ashes, carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You were my rescue story. Oh, you are, you are, you are my rescue story. Ages. Before I had a name, before I needed grace. Singing songs of redemption, Cause every time I ran away, you were louder than my shame. And now where would I be without you? Where would I be? Jesus, you were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story. You lifted me up from the ashes, carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. Never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You my testimony. Oh, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You my testimony. Oh, you never gave up on me. Oh, you never gave up on me. Oh, this is my testimony. You were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story, lifting me up from the ashes, carrying my soul from death to life. 
mercy gather, mended and told, empty handed, but not forsaken, have been set free, have been set free. been set free. <laughs> You've been set free. Amazing grace. Raising up the broken to life. If you're not feeling that freedom this morning, now's a wonderful time to come forward and to lay the lies from the enemy down. Give them away. Cry out to God. If you're on the mountaintop, come forward and give Him praise. Be in His presence. Live that freedom. There's people here that will pray with you. Come forward as we sing. All these pieces broken and scattered In mercy gather men Empty-handed, but not forsaken, have been set free, have been set free, yeah. Amazing grace, how sweet.
Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making us alive with him. Father, I just pray your blessing over today. Help us to realize that it's all about you. And that there is abundant life in Christ. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, Before we get started, I mentioned the Thailand team. I'll tell you what, they hit the ground running when they got over there. They are bearing fruit and more is to come. Keep them in your prayers. We got a short video to show you just exactly what's going on over there. So enjoy. Maybe we have a short video. Yes, there it is. Have you, you guys understand what we are about to do? Okay, well, you are going to receive Jesus. And you are going to, after today, you're going to be Christians. And you're going to live your life according to the way Jesus wants you to. And Jesus promises us that when we ask him into our heart, that he will come and live in us. I believe. That Jesus is the Son of God. And it's my desire to live my life for Him. Amen. Amen. You did. You did. Because of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. We do this just like Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Amen and amen. Okay, hey, message over. Have a nice day, right? How do you follow that? That is awesome. Um, That is what your tithes and offerings make possible. That's just one of our over 20-some missions that we support and um, that you support. So thank you for your giving. Um, We are in a year-long series in all of Ephesians chapter 2. This week we're going to be in verses 4 and 5, so we got two new verses, which means we got new verses to memorize. Um, And it's good news. And speaking of good news, about 34, 35 years ago, I got some really good news. Um, My lovely wife, Sherry, today is her birthday. So... We didn't do this yet, but I want to sing her happy birthday. So let's sing happy birthday to Sherry. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to 
Happy birthday to you. And <laughs> amen. And now I'm a dead man walking, so. Okay, happy birthday, I love you. Um, so um, you should have seen, we got new papers in the lobby, these beautiful yellow papers that have all five verses. Uh, I will be quite honest, I'm not doing well in memorizing, so I'm going to use my cheat sheet today. But if you would, if you don't have this, turn to your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and we're going to read them together. So um, it's not quite the responsive reading from old school church, but it is reading in unison. I believe there is great power in the Word of God. It is spirit and truth. And when it is spoken together corporately, I believe there is even more power. So you know what? We're going we're gonna to lift him up and start in his Word, the best place to start. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. You ready? Here we go. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Amen. So, today we're kind of shifting focus. The first few weeks we were in uh, 1 through 3 and talking about sin and what separated us from uh, Christ And now we step into grace. That will be the theme for the next few weeks. Anybody ever hear the old saying, I got good news and I got bad news, right? Um, Who likes to hear the good news first? You know, they ask you, what do you want to hear? Who likes to hear the bad news first? Oh, wow, a lot of bad news. Well, that's what happens here. We have have the bad news first in one through three, and then the good news four and five. But it's interesting, as I was studying for uh, the message this week, Uh, past few weeks, as I read one through five, you know, you have that Christianese speak and you hear about the gospel, the gospel, and well, what's that mean? Well, in the original Greek, the gospel literally means good news. So if you're confused about the gospel or how to explain it to somebody, it's right there in Ephesians 2, one through five. That literally is the gospel. You were dead in your sin, deserving of death. But because of God and what he did for you, you were made alive in Christ. And that, my friends, is very good news. So now you can put that in your go-to scripture when somebody asks you what the gospel is. You can explain it fully. Um, So we're in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 today. Um, We use the NIV version, the New International Version here, not because it's the greatest version, but it's very solid. There are other good solid versions too, the ESV, the NASB, the New King James. Um, I encourage you to look at different versions. Here is my master's degree uh, declaration on different versions of the Bible. They all say the same thing. Some are word for word. Some are thought for thought and more reader friendly. Now, there are some you can get in trouble with, but if you stick with the standards like we do, uh, that are scholarly, a team of scholars from the latest manuscripts, you can't go wrong. So we just read from the NIV, and it's very good. But when you look at the original Greek, I believe it is a stronger uh, way to get the message and what Paul was trying to get across to the church of Ephesus as he wrote this letter. So I had Ryan make me a graphic that puts side by side the NIV at the top and the Greek word for word translation at the bottom. And you'll see a difference. Because when you read the NIV, it starts out because of his great love for us. And I think it's tempting to make it about us. Oh, God loves me so much. I'm so loved. Me, me, me. Yeah, he does love you so much. He does. But it's not about you. It's not about you or me. It's about God. And when you look at the Greek, it starts out. You see the Greek um, 
when they write down a thought, they want the most important thing to be first. And it's but God. It's about Him, but God. So they both start with the same word, but, which is a conjunction. Junction, what's your function? <laughs> it is a conjunction. It picks up those two phrases. It, it makes the transition from the sin into the life in Christ. When you're reading the Bible and you see the word but, go back and go forward and see what the writer was trying to do. Um, so, but God, if you get one thing out of this message today, one thing, it's about God. It's always been about God. It always will be about God. We are dead when we become Christians. We become dead. You saw the baptism. And you become up and you live. Christ lives in you. So, but God. It moves on. Rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. You know, there's an old, uh, you hear mercy and grace all the time. Today we're focusing on grace, but we can't leave out mercy. And, and those can be confusing terms, but there's an old saying that kind of puts it in perspective. Um, mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve, which is death. And grace is God giving us us something we do not deserve, which is life. Folks, this is a matter of life and death. Literally, a matter of life and death. So, mercy, God not giving us what we do deserve. Grace, God giving us something we do not deserve. And we're going to explore that a little more. Um, mercy, in this particular passage, defined in the Greek is the moral quality of feeling compassion, especially showing kindness to someone who is in need. And let me tell you, we are in great need. <laughs> great need. Jesus' sacrifice delivered us from death when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. Romans 10, 9. We're saved. That's mercy. <laughs> and the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. You see, it's not just a one-time thing. His mercies are new every morning. When you wake up in the morning and you have breath in your lungs, that's a gift from God. James 1.17 says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. When you breathe, if God is in fact omnipresent, which He is, the very air you breathe, when you breathe in, you're breathing in God. You're breathing in that gift. So right now in this moment, I'd like us to sit up straight. Get all the room for your lungs that you can get. And let's just take deep breath thank you Jesus thank you for every breath it's a gift and it's a gift we need to use and it's not for us or about us it's about him but God it ultimately is for us we are the benefactors but it's about him. He is rich in mercy. When you wake up in the morning and you breathe your breath, you've got a purpose. You've got a purpose. What are we doing with that? It moves on because of his great love for us. I really like in the Greek that loves twice, like he doubles down in the Greek. <laughs> it's awesome. And this isn't just any kind of love. You see, the English language compared to the Greek is very weak. We have one word for love. I think that's why we're kind of messed up when it comes to love. Because there's one word. And in the Greek, there's several words. 
There's phileo, which is brotherly love. There's other types of love. And this particular love is agape, sacrificial love. It's the kind of love God has for us, sacrificial love. We see it in the cross. No man can fathom how high and how deep and how wide God's love is for you. He loves you so much. And if you're not feeling that right now, I get it. This life is hard. It's okay. Press back into him. He's rich in mercy. There's nothing you can do that will separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It's beautiful. Because of his great love for us. It moves on. We were dead in our trans trespasses. Dead. Charles alluded to it in his prayer. The scripture says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that love. That's truly sacrificial love. Are you going to die for somebody who disobeys you all the time? You might die for some, a good man, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's incredible mercy. You know, if you're here today and you haven't, you're not saved. You have not confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It takes courage to come. It takes the Holy Spirit pricking at your heart to get you here. And I appreciate that. I want to honor that. But I got to tell you, don't wait. Because until you do make that decision... You're a dead man walking. Your fate's not going to be a good one. God has to draw you to that. I don't want to scare you into it. I can't guilt you into it. His loving kindness does that. But if you haven't made that decision and you're seeking, I beg you, I urge you, don't wait. Don't wait. There's good news. He made us alive with Christ. Very interesting in the Greek. Made us alive with is one word. Made us alive with is one Greek word. It's shuzo opueo. Shuzo opueo. Made us alive with. Very interesting word. Kind of a mysterious word. Um, I believe as I read it, it has several meanings, at least two. When you look at the, um, there's several definitions for it, but the main one that stuck out to me was to quicken or to animate conjointly. There's a sense of urgency there in this Greek that Paul wanted to get across. There's a sense of urgency. And the made us alive with, yes, you're saved, you're made alive, you have eternal life, but it also has another meaning. And that is, I believe, what John talks about when he says Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly, here and now. Salvation's wonderful. Eternal life is wonderful. But we don't have to walk around this earth moping and hurting. There is life in Christ, and it is available for the taking. So the double meaning, yes, salvation. Christianese word, positional sanctification. <laughs> I'm in right standing with God. You got that. But I also believe it's about progressive sanctification, another Christianese word, which basically means becoming more like Jesus every day. Becoming more like Jesus every day. And I believe that is where the made us alive with Christ is tangible. It's a goal. It's there, but it's not automatic. Not automatic. Both meanings of made alive in Christ are a byproduct of His grace. Remember, grace is the theme of 
this next few weeks. So I want to ask yourself while you're sitting there right now, because only you know in your heart of hearts the answer to this question. Am I alive in Christ? Am I alive with Christ? Truly alive. Not just breathing, not just saved, not just eternal life, but my day-to-day happenings and doings, my thoughts, my words, my deeds, do they reflect that vibrant life? Am I alive in Christ? And you know what? If your answer today is no, that's okay. This world's hard. It beats you down. You know, 2019 was a real tough year for me and my family. I've never wished a year away in my life, but I'll tell you what, when that calendar changed to 2020, I was happy. It's okay. But you know what? Jesus is still there. That life is still there, and we can step into it, but we got to make the choice. we got to make the choice. So what's it look like to be alive in Christ? Well, there's many ways you can sum it up, but I believe uh, what I'd like to concentrate on today is right relationship. Being alive in Christ requires right relationship, not just relationship. It's not enough to know Him. The word says even the devils, the devil and the demons know him and they shudder. You see, they have a relationship, but they don't have a right relationship. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the alive in Christ and all the fringe benefits of it come. But again, it's not for us or about us. It's about him. And we've got to keep that at the forefront of our mind. We want all those benefits. We want the good stuff. We want the favor. But don't make it about you. Don't make it about you. So, as I was studying, I believe there's four ways that God's grace manifests itself here and now and as we live and breathe and move on this earth. Four ways that God's grace manifests us. Manifests. The first way is for everybody, sinners and saints alike. God makes the sun to shine on the good and the wicked. God gives us breath every morning when we wake up. Whether you're the most evil person in the world or the most saintly of saints, God extends that grace to everybody. But for those who aren't in Christ, it's temporary. If you don't make the decision... It doesn't last long. Your life is but a mist here and gone. And the other three ways His grace manifests are for Christians only. Membership has its advantages. (laughs) Three ways. First of all, His grace manifests in salvation. What a wonderful gift. But it is a gift. And it comes automatically phone's ringing for somebody to make a choice right now. Maybe that was your bell. (laughs) Right? Hello, here's your sign. Salvation. Automatically, you get it. You don't have to do anything other than say, I'm in. I'm all in. The second is also automatic. Eternal life. Both incredible. Both wonderful gifts. If that's all you ever got, it should be enough, but... There's more. (laughs) You see, God loves you, and he wants you to live that abundant life. And that brings us to the fourth way that his grace manifests on this earth. The made alive in Christ becomes real and tangible and available and daily, but it's not automatic. It's not automatic. It's there, but you got to take it. And it requires right relationships, right relationship with God, right relationship with Jesus, right relationship with His Holy Spirit living inside of you. Right relationship, very important. An intimate awareness of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. That's great power. What are you doing with it? 
What are you doing with that power? And part of those tangible ways that aren't automatic, that are there for the taking, I believe there's several examples I want to give you of what that looks like. That you have to have right relationship. That you have to go after with faith and with courage. One of which is a decreasing pattern of sin in your life. A decreasing pattern of sin. You see, the Holy Spirit will never enter a person and allow that person to live like the world won't happen. If you call yourself a Christian and there was not a change in your life, I'd question whether I'm a Christian or not. I'm just saying. There's a change. The old man is gone. The new has come. If you're living there right now, I urge you to see me after the service or one of the elders. Because the change is wonderful. A decreasing pattern of sin. You know, some people get it right away. They change, they do a 180. Me, <laughs> you got to get a real long spreadsheet to look at my decreasing pattern of sin as the way it goes up. But you know what? God's still faithful. I'm a work in progress. And I have some dips and valleys. But he's still there. Decreasing pattern of sin. Victory over self. I'm my own worst enemy. Victory over self. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> it is awesome, and it's there. But you've got to take it through right relationship. A constant flow of the Holy Spirit through our personalities. That's another made alive in Christ benefit. Your countenance. What do you look like to the outside world? When they see you, do they see Jesus shining in your face? Or do they just see a grumpy person who's beat down by the world? You're going to have those days. You are. It's not all sunshine and bubbles. But you know what? That doesn't mean to stop trying. And that doesn't mean Holy Spirit power, love, and self-control has stopped. You just got to work towards it. It's painful. It's grueling. It's an exercise. It's a daily thing. Constant flow of the Holy Spirit through your personality. You're a lot more likely to approach someone, to listen to someone who is positive, who is shining the light of Christ, than that old grumpy dude at work who's never. Don't be like that. Life's too good. Life's too short or too long, depending on how you look at it, to live like that. You don't have to live like that. Another way that God's grace manifests itself, the made alive in Christ, the tangible that we have to work for that's not automatic, is fruitfulness in Christian service. We saw some fruit today in that video, right? That's fruit. That's making disciples. Baptizing in the name of the Father and teaching and training. That's fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit, not the fruits, one fruit. You get them all. Are we shining that? What are we doing with it? You keep fruit for yourself, you can't eat it all, it spoils. You got to give it away before it spoils because God's going to fill the basket back up and you're going to keep giving out fruit. What are you doing? When you see that person who's hurting and the Holy Spirit's like, you need to go talk to them. Are you doing it? You see, how I know that this made us alive with Christ refers to the here and now, refers to things we got to go after. Foreshadowing verse 10 of Ephesians 2, God created good works in advance for us. That does not mean those works automatically get done. There's good works prepared for you and you and you and every one of you in advance. But you got to do them. And I believe you're going to have to stand at the throne at the end and, hey, I put this person in your path and you were like, I'm kind of busy right now. Or, hey, 
I gave you, I blessed you with a good job and you'd rather have that fishing pole than tithe your 10%. And that was one less soul I had prepared in advance in Thailand but never got exposed to my message. See those opportunities arise every day. Good works prepared in advance. I believe there's something every day if we look hard enough. God opens doors. We got to step through them. It's not automatic. And when you serve someone without expecting anything in return, and they say, why are you so nice to me? That opens the door for the gospel message. And fruit happens. And you know what? You're even more blessed than they are. Another way grace manifests itself. Awareness of the presence of God and union with Him. Constant awareness of His presence. The enemy does everything he can to turn your face away from God. All day, every way, every day he's throwing stuff at you left and right. And you constantly got to be aware of His presence. Practice being in the presence of Jesus all the time. Pray before you go in a building. hosting the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. You're hosting the Spirit. The Word says when Jesus was baptized, He came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descended on Him like a dove. Think about a dove. How careful do you have to walk to keep that dove with you? Right relationship is how careful you have to walk to keep the Holy Spirit activated and flowing through you in your personality. Growth in grace is another one. Growth in grace. His mercies are new every morning and His grace is there to be new too. Some people call it favor. You just look at some people who you know are seeking Christ with everything they got and it just seems like everything falls into place for them, right? Well, guess what? I guarantee you they're going through the same struggles you are. They don't know what the future holds, but they're secure in who holds their future. And that gives them joy. And that allows them to walk through life growing in grace and giving His grace. Because it's not about you, it's not for you, it's about Him and it's for everybody. And last but not least, an unbroken spirit of worship. How would you like to have that? An unbroken spirit of worship no matter what. Many of you are sitting out there right now and you got some really bad news. Maybe you were diagnosed with cancer. Maybe a friend was diagnosed with cancer. Maybe somebody close to you died. Maybe you were in Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam and you saw some things that some people should just, you should never have to see. This world's hard, it beats you down. But you know what? When you're at your lowest and you make a decision that I'm going to worship God anyway, He honors that. He honors that. When you're down at your lowest, get on your face and cry out to God or crank up your favorite worship music and lift it up. That, my friends, is offering your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. When you don't want to worship, when the last thing you want to do is praise God and you do it anyway because it's about Him, that is being made alive in Christ. Amen. It's about you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Grace is the gift that keeps on giving, Clark. These grace manifestations I'm talking about are available to us and for us, but they're not about us, but God. You see, God gave us eminent domain. Eminent domain over these things. Just like the good works prepared in advance don't get done unless we do them, these made alive in Christ benefits, I guess, for lack of a better word, require work. They require right relationship. We have eminent domain, but it's not guaranteed. It's much like the Israelites who got out of Egypt 
And the first day they're out of Egypt, they're already wandering around and complaining. We don't have water. We don't have food. We were better off in Egypt. We need a different God. We need new gods. Transfer that to today. I can't stand my job. I hate my life. I don't have enough money. My wife drives me crazy. My husband, I can't stand him. I'm tired of being fat and I'm tired of being ugly and I'm just tired of me, 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 blah, blah, blah. (laughs) I get it. I've been there. But stop wandering in the desert. The promised land is there. And God's going to go with you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You know, God told Moses before they went in, he says, you know what, I'm not going to go with you. And Moses says, you can't do that. No. You can't do that. Without you, we're nothing. And God relented and said, okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. And he's with you today. No matter what you're walking through. No matter the worst diagnosis. No matter whatever. No matter if you drop dead right this minute. You've got eternity with Jesus. No more pain. No more suffering. No more tears. Yes, that is life. That's life. Stop wandering. And stop wondering. Paul said who wrote this letter, the verses we're reading, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Your life is hidden in Christ and it will be revealed in the end. You will get a glorified body. Then it can be about you and him. But right now, well, I'm not sure about that. It's always about him. But God but God. And like I said, that, that alive in Christ, it ebbs and flows as life hits us, but it's always there. And able to sustain it and to maintain it is a battle. Every day, you're at war. That's why the Bible says to put on the full armor of God. Let me tell you what, we love salvation, but if you just go out to battle with the helmet of salvation, you're naked and you're going to take a whooping. You have to die to yourself. You got to get back to the basics. Read the Bible every day. Do what it says. Pray. Repent. Wonderful Christianese word. But it's important. It's lost its luster in the church because we make it about ourselves. But you got to repent. That means to stop the direction you're heading and to turn and run back to God. Confess your sins to Him. You know, the Bible says that we should take up our cross daily and follow Him. And I think we got that misinterpreted a little wrong. I think most Christians see that. They get up in the morning, I got my cross. Oh, I'm taking it up, Jesus. Here I am. It's lunchtime. I got my cross. Oh, I made it through the day. That's that's defeat. That's not life. Yeah, we take up our cross daily. But Jesus lived for 33 years on this earth. How long did he carry a cross? How long? One day. One day. And then he got off that cross and rose to life, defeating sin and death for you. You see, the cross has one function. One function. I'm not talking spiritually. I'm talking in the flesh, in the physical nature. The cross is an instrument of death. That's all it is. It's an instrument of death. And we are to die to ourselves daily. That's what he's saying. You take up your cross just long enough when that temptation comes and you feel like giving in and you die to yourself. Take it, Lord. And you get off that cross and you come to life. And you shine His light to the world. And then when it comes again, you die again. Sometimes it's multiple times a day. But you don't drag it around all day. That's not being made alive in Christ. 
grace is sufficient for us. And His power is made perfect in our weakness. Am I alive in Christ? Does He know me? Two things are said at the throne to you. Well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. Gives me goosebumps. The very God who created you, who numbered the hairs on your head, if you don't make that decision to follow him and you die, he says, get out of my face. I never knew you. I don't want that for any one of you. My heart breaks for that. Don't stay in that position. It's there. See me. See one of the elders. See one of the deacons. Don't wait. One minute. You never know when your life's going to be required of you. To ensure he knows us requires right relationship. My favorite promise in the Bible. Come near to me and I will come near to you. That's a promise. Think about the times in your life when you really make that dedicated effort to come near to him. You sense his presence coming near to you. You've got to maintain that. Sustain it. We love that part. God will come near to you if you come near to him. But we forget about the second part of that verse. Next it says, Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Right relationship. Finally, it's by grace you've been saved. We've been talking about grace. By grace you've been saved. God's grace is free, but it's not cheap. It was bought at an incredible price. Jesus' blood was the only way. The Bible says it has to be a blood sacrifice for atonement. I don't know why. It's Him, not me. So Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 begins with God, but God and His mercy. He didn't kill us, though we deserved it. It ends with Jesus and His grace. He saved us and made us alive. It's about Him. And there's love in the middle. It's a love sandwich. <laughs> with grace on top and mercy on the bottom. It's awesome. It's awesome. He's the bread of life. Feast on him. Feast on him. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, We do not have a high priest, he's talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's not a one-time thing. It's every day. Mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. Step into it. We talked about repentance. I can't guilt you into it. The Word says His kindness leads us to repentance. His grace leads us to repentance. He's so kind and so loving. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Him and who He is through us. Our identity is in Christ. Mark Pritchard died spiritually. Christ who lives in me. Anything else, anything else we try to find our identity in is going to disappoint. Fame, money, drugs, alcohol, sex, work. It's going to disappoint. It's temporary. It's about Him. You see, God's grace and mercy changes your life. It gives you a new life. So you can in turn change the world around you. We've got to extend grace to others. Don't compare your grace to somebody else's grace. God apportions it the way he sees fit. And you got enough just for you.
trust him. Lose yourself in Jesus and his mercy and his love and his grace. Be alive in Jesus and pass it on. Let's pray. God, you're so loving, so merciful, so full of grace. Father, help us to press into you, to seek that right relationship, to do the things we know we should do, to read our Bible, to do what it says, to practice being in your presence, to shine your light, to serve others without expecting anything in return. Share the good news. Life's too short. There is a sense of urgency. Help us to be urgent about it and be alive in Jesus. We love you and praise you and ask all this in his holy and precious name. Amen. Okay, we're coming to a time of communion. Before we do that, if you haven't made that decision, if you're languishing and wandering in the desert and need help, there's a white card on your bulletin. You can tear it off. You can fill it out. You can put it in the offering or the boxes in the back. We go over those every Monday in staff meeting. We want to help you. You can also text the church at info at come to crossroads.org. We want to help you. We want to walk you into that life abundant. So please take the time to do that. Um, as we take communion, I want you to remember... To me, that is the word that encapsulates communion. Remember what Jesus did for you. His loving kindness, that grace that's free but not cheap. His body broken and bleeding on a cross. And when you look at that bread and you think about his body just being pummeled and his blood pouring out for you, that blood that it required to, to purchase your atonement, put you in right standing with God. Remember, examine your heart. If there's somebody you haven't forgiven, let it go. Ask Holy Spirit to just wash you clean. Clear all that out in Jesus' name. Partake and remember, you know, we don't have closed communion. The table's open for everyone. But it is sacred. And it is special. And it requires a circumcised heart. Torn open. All Jesus wants is all your heart. All of it. Father, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. Father, help us to remember that every day. Help us to step in to that life in Christ to make it all about you and just watch our world change around us. We love you and we praise you. Bless these emblems. In Jesus' name.
For those of you who don't know me, my name's Jim Thomas. I am one of the original elders of this church. And I've watched it grow from 55 people to, if you use preacher math, 650. Okay? <laughs> we'll live with that. But as attendance grew, so did our budgets. Our budgets were, the church was always formed with one thing in mind, with a Jesus outside those walls. And we've done just that. Our mission budget has proven that. We are all over the country, all over the world. We just saw a video earlier about Thailand. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But we also have missionaries in Dominican Republic, Mexico, Africa. We, we touch a lot of people. And, you know, through our giving, through the giving we give in this little church, we touch thousands of lives. And that's hard to comprehend, but thousands of lives. And really, yeah, we do. We do that so much. When we give out of our heart, this is what happens. When God touches us, things work. And, you know, I'm friends with a professional baseball coach. And when he's home, we get together sometimes, and he said, you know, what I do at night when I lay down, I ask God, what can I do better tomorrow? And maybe we should take that in. When you lay down tonight, say, Lord, what can I do better tomorrow to serve your kingdom? You know, is it a better offering? Is it getting involved in the church? Is it getting a, a more participation, joining a small group? What can we do? What can I do to serve you more? And that's a pretty good challenge. Fathers, we give our offerings just right now. We ask that you would just touch us. Let us go away here from this place refreshed today that we might look to serve you even more tomorrow and the day after and the day after. But Father, watch over each offering. I'm sure you'll use it wisely that hearts will be touched. And we pray this in his holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship God one more time. didn't want to blow the mic. 
Every every morning at 6 a.m., there is an elder here, there is a deacon here. Great way to be made alive in Christ. Start your day with that breath, come in and pray and go take it to the world. Next, survey says, Crossroads Church, Friendly Feud, coming up February 16th at 6 p.m. Roy's got a big night planned. Everybody invited. All right, Uh, last but not least, Spring Craft and Vendor Show, Saturday, April 4th. Mark your calendar. Tons of vendors. Money goes to a good cause. And last but not least, I'm sorry, one other thing. Now, stacking chairs stinks, but it's got to be done. But just so you know, halfway around the world, they're doing the same thing. (laughs) So, hey... Fruitfulness in Christian service, so please um, stack chairs. If you can stack them eight high, leave them where they are. You don't have to slide them to the walls. Thank you for doing that every week. Um, Upward's awesome, so um, let's pray, and we'll get you on your way. Father, you're awesome. Thank you for making us us alive with Christ. Help us just to uh, get that and get out there and live our life for you. It's all about you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.